February 11, 1861, the newly elected President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, left Springfield, Illinois on a train that would carry him to Washington, D.C. for his inauguration. Almost 100 stops were planned along the way. Baltimore was to be the last stop before reaching the capital. He was in many ways unknown, so at each of these stops, Lincoln emerged from his train car to introduce himself to as many citizens as possible, except in Baltimore. Lincoln's Pinkerton security detail warned him that because Baltimore was a Confederate-leaning city, and a violent one, there were two plots against his life here. Lincoln was required to sneak through the city with his cars pulled by horses down Pratt Street toward Camden Station in the middle of the night. He was disguised as an ailing gentleman, accompanied by his sad but attentive wife, who was in reality Pinkerton's first female agent. On February 23rd at Baltimore's Calvert Street Station, an enthusiastic crowd gathered to greet the new president-elect, unaware that he was already in D.C. The crowd was expectant, and not all of them were white. This lithograph of a crowd waiting to see Lincoln was the equivalent of a news photo of the day. Its only purpose was to show what happened at this public event. But it also happened to catch a glimpse of a cross-section of Baltimore society in 1860 that might surprise us. In 1860, the Civil War had not yet begun, and slavery was still the law of the land. You will notice, however, that this is a racially mixed crowd. Marked with a blue arrow is a well-dressed African-American coachman. That is not so unusual. Coachmen, even enslaved coachmen, were often well-dressed to reflect the affluence of the wealthy whites whose coaches they managed. What is far more surprising and marked with a yellow arrow are three African-Americans, two of which appear to be businessmen, dressed in ways essentially indistinguishable from the white people around them. It reflects a Baltimore society, especially an African-American society, more complex than the simple slavery that we often imagine. Perhaps even more surprising is the fact that in Baltimore in 1860, prior to the Civil War, the vast majority of black Baltimoreans were free. At least they were not slaves. To be sure, few were as prosperous as these gentlemen and the lady in the lithograph. But the fact that these well-dressed black people, shown in an otherwise casual picture, suggests that a whole lot more was going on in the city than is often supposed. Here are just a few of the things that were going on. Thirty-five years before Lincoln's election, in 1825, an African-American layman named Truman Pratt founded the Orchard Street Church. Pratt was thought to be a freed slave of John Edgar Howard, a hero of the War of 1812, and the man who donated the land for Baltimore's Washington Monument. The congregation at Orchard Street built with their own hands the first version of this church in 1837. This was a year before Frederick Douglass escaped slavery from Fells Point. The men of the congregation, some slave but most free, labored on the church while the women held up torches to see in the dark, all after performing their regular work during the day. A contemporary newspaper declared the church handsome. A tunnel was built under the church that some believe was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Certainly the members of a congregation founded by Truman Pratt, who purchased his own freedom and who defiantly lived to 102, would have been involved in helping fellow blacks escape slavery. The church was rebuilt in 1859, and then this third and final building was constructed in 1882. It is now the home of the Urban League. Here is another thing representing what was going on in Baltimore's African-American community. After the Civil War, in 1866, a bunch of white ship caulkers in the city refused to work any longer with African-American ship caulkers. The whites complained to their boss, and the African-Americans were fired. The black community responded forcefully when 16 black businessmen, led by Isaac Myers, but including Frederick Douglass, founded the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company, the first black-owned shipbuilding company in the U.S. In 
It operated successfully at the end of Thames Street and Fells Point for 18 years, sometimes hiring white ship caulkers as well. The Isaac Myers Frederick Douglass Museum, located on the site, preserves the memory of this enterprise today. Keep in mind that there had to be at least 16 black businessmen in Baltimore who shortly after the end of the Civil War had built up enough capital to invest in this successful enterprise. Two of them might have been the gentlemen we saw in the lithograph. So, what is the point of all this random information? It is this. In a city so confederate and violent that even a white president with a security detail could not easily find safe passage. In a nation, state, and city where slavery was the law and violence so ever-present, even among whites, that as early as 1812 Baltimore became known as Mobtown, in a place where young male and female African Americans, sometimes young children, could be snatched off the streets and sold into slavery, and in a place where African Americans were told in 1857 by the Supreme Court's Chief Justice Roger Taney of Maryland that blacks had no rights which white men were bound to honor, seeming to slam the door on any hope of political or legal change. A complex community of mostly free black people armed with courage, determination, and faith in God's justice, emerged to preserve their cultural heritage, fight for as much independence from whites as they could get, resist racial oppression, build churches, benevolent organizations, businesses, and schools, argue among themselves about defensive and offensive tactics, and hope that in the land of the free, there might come a day when they no longer had to live under the constant systematic terror of having their property, liberty, and even life suddenly and randomly snatched from them. Unfortunately, that day has never yet been fully realized. This presentation and the ones to follow will tell some of the stories of this community, but first we may ask, where did this large active community of free blacks come from? Maryland was founded as a colony in 1632 as a refuge for English Catholics fleeing persecution in Europe. Early colonialists had a difficult time growing profitable crops as their English sponsors wanted them to do. So tobacco became the chief cash crop in the 17th century. Indentured, mostly European servants, were at first used for the heavy labor. But the first enslaved Africans arrived in St. Mary's in 1642, only one decade after Maryland's founding, and only two decades after the first enslaved Africans arrived on the shores of Virginia in 1619. Tobacco is very labor intensive in both growing and in processing. Its green leaves are large and heavy, and the plants need to be topped or clipped while they are growing. As we have noted, indentured servants were initially used to do the heavy work. Indentured servants were normally people from England who had committed a crime and whose punishment could be worked off in the colonies instead of going to prison or even being executed at home. Or they might be so poor in England that doing agricultural work in the colonies might seem like an opportunity if freedom and prosperity were awaiting them in the end. England could get rid of its unwanted people while meeting the needs for labor in the colonies. Indentured service was hard, but still not like slavery. It was for a term, perhaps seven years, after which such servants were usually freed. But when, later in the 18th century, the supply of indentured servants slowed due to better economic conditions in England, and enslaved Africans appeared in the colonies at the beginning of the 17th century, Planters soon preferred owning slaves to having indentured servants. By the 1690s, large-scale importation of enslaved Africans began in the tidewater regions of Maryland. And to clear up any legal confusion between indentured servants and slaves, in 1664 the Maryland State Legislature made the enslaved and their children, as defined through the mother, slaves for life. In English law, one's standing in society was always defined through the father, 
But this law allowed white men to rape black women, father children with them, and yet prevent the children from claiming the privileges of being white. Thus was born the one-drop rule. One drop of African-American blood makes you a black and not a white in this new world divided sharply by race. As we have repeatedly noted, raising tobacco was labor-intensive. After harvesting the heavy leaves, men had to hang and turn each leaf in a drying house. Then the dry tobacco had to be pressed into large barrels, called hogsheads. Then the hogsheads had to be rolled to a dock to be put on a ship to sail for Europe. If hogsheads were rolled more than six miles, it tended to damage the tobacco. So plantation docks dotted the tributaries of the Chesapeake, and there was at first no need for centralized ports. It should be noted that the European planters on the left would receive all the benefits from the heavy labor of raising and selling of the tobacco. In other words, the enslaved African Americans' labor, its value, was stolen from them, just as the land had been stolen from the Native Americans. The proceeds of all this theft was reflected in the fine dress and beautiful homes and beautiful churches built with tithes paid in hogsheads of tobacco. And the enslaved African Americans on the right, who did all the heavy work and were the less well dressed, were allowed to live and work another day, usually. The small white circle marks the location of London Town on the South River, a small docking site founded in 1683 that served nearby tobacco plantations and participated directly in both the transatlantic tobacco and slave trade. Tobacco grown nearby was brought to this dock for shipment to Europe, and men and women captured on the west coast of Africa were offloaded from the ships and sold to planters in Maryland. Baltimore wouldn't be founded for almost 50 years, so the politics of Maryland were dominated by the local planters of the Tidewater region. They would gather in public houses to drink and conduct business, places like the William Brown House, the Red Brick Building. This is the William Brown House today, a site near Annapolis that can easily be visited. This restored historical site has noted in its signage that its history cannot be told without slavery. In fact, of the 20 ships that called on London town selling slaves, no less than 700 enslaved Africans, 700 souls had perished in the middle passage just approaching this one small destination. They never even made it to the port to live to be slaves on plantations. And how do we know these statistics? Records of how many enslaved Africans were boarded on the ship and how many were delivered and how many were lost were kept in the files of the insurance companies, even today, who in both England and New England underwrote the slave trade. The African American Museum in Washington memorialized each and every one of these ships and their human cargo in its exhibition in the basement of the museum. This bloody business made the economy and the politics of the Eastern Shore and Southern Maryland indistinguishable from that of the Deep South. But a big change with huge consequences began to take place in the middle of the 18th century. Starting in the 1750s, the European tobacco market began to get saturated and the prices dropped, endangering the livelihoods of the planters and of those whose very existence depended upon the market. The planters were rescued when it was discovered that raising wheat and other grains in the mid-Atlantic region could be even more profitable than tobacco and much more reliable as a commodity. In Baltimore, it was Dr. John Stevenson, an Irish immigrant, who in 1750 shipped the first barrel of milled wheat to Ireland and got a good response to its quality. This discovery transformed the region. When Stevenson began shipping flour to Ireland, it turned Baltimore from a sleepy city trading in tobacco to a trading powerhouse rivaling New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. Baltimore restructured the city's economy based on flour. Trails were transformed into roads, and flour mills were built along the Jones Falls, the Gwynns Falls, and the Patapsico River. In 
Warehouses were built on the 1,000 foot long wharves that extended into the harbor. The roads from Baltimore soon reached all the way to Pennsylvania and Baltimore ships sailed not only to Ireland but to ports in Europe, the Caribbean, and South America. Wheat could be stored in warehouses like Johns Hopkins warehouses at what is now known as Hopkins Place in downtown Baltimore. And it was no accident that in 1830 when America's first railroad, the B&O, built the first 13 miles of track, they ran from the location of what became the Mount Clare Station in West Baltimore to the Ellicott Mills in what we now call Ellicott City. If you ever wondered where some of our local names came from, now you know. At one point there were 12 grist mills along the Jones Falls within four miles of Baltimore. But this great boon for the European or white economy became a disaster for local enslaved African Americans. It resulted in the second Middle Passage. Growing grains was much less labor intensive than growing tobacco. Surplus slaves had to be disposed of and mid-Atlantic white Americans began ridding themselves of blacks, making money in the sale of slaves by shipping them off to the deep south. The second Middle Passage had begun. If Maryland and the Middle Atlantic region needed less slaves because of turning away from tobacco, a number of things came together to make the South need more slaves. The first of them was the invention of the cotton gin in 1793. It made the processing of cotton more efficient. And the second major development was President Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase in 1803 that nearly doubled the size of the United States. By accepting the French colonial territories, the area in which cotton could be planted vastly expanded. And the third development was that Congress voted to end the importation of enslaved Africans after 1808, cutting off that source of labor for the U.S. economy. Baltimoreans might want to note that for a brief period before the Civil War, the USS Constellation, now docked in our harbor, intercepted slave ships off the coast of Africa. All of these things meant that the growing of cotton exploded in the South and more labor in the form of more slaves were needed. As a consequence, from the late 1700s up to the Civil War, 1.2 million African Americans were shipped away from the East Coast to the Deep South in what can be called the Second Middle Passage. 30,000 of them were shipped through Baltimore to places like Savannah and New Orleans for the burgeoning cotton business and sugarcane plantations. Blacks in Baltimore, as elsewhere, were terrified of being sold down the river. Free blacks, even children, were not immune to being picked off our streets and often were, never again to be seen by their families. And life expectancy, because of the harsh conditions, was approximately five years. Being shipped down the river seemed like a death sentence, and it very nearly was. As much as possible, it was resisted by blacks, enslaved and free. Frederick Douglass was nearly sold down the river. His home was the Y Plantation in the Eastern Shores, Talbot County. But twice, both as a young boy and as a young man, he was sent to live in Fells Point in Baltimore. When he was 18 years old, he plotted with three friends to escape the plantation, but was betrayed by one of the frightened plotters. Instead of being sold, he was sent to a breaker to be beaten into submission. However, he beat and humiliated the breaker. It was a miracle that he was not sold down the river, but rather was exiled to Baltimore for the second time. And there, two years later, in 1838, at the age of 20, he made good on his plans to escape. The slave trading he described later in life during his speeches was not the importing of African slaves, but the workings of the Second Middle Passage as coffles of slaves, weeping and moaning at their fate and separation from their loved ones, were loaded on ships in Fells Point to be shipped south forever.
Eleven years later, in 1849, Harriet Tubman was motivated to escape her captivity in Dorchester County, Maryland, when she learned that her brothers were to be sold off. The next year she returned from freedom in the North and risked capture and torture and death in Maryland to rescue her niece and her niece's children when she heard that they were to be sold off. And thus she began her career as the most famous and successful conductor on the Underground Railroad. So, apart from escaping, where did all the free blacks in Baltimore come from? There were many sources. One large source of freedom was gratitude for military service. The southern planters who founded America were afraid of arming black slaves during the Revolution. But when the British offered freedom to those blacks who joined their side, General Washington was forced to relent, and blacks became so numerous as to make up about 10% of the Continental Army. Some of them were such fierce fighters that the German or Hessian troops that aided the British were afraid to go on what they considered suicide missions against the black soldiers. Many, but not all of those who fought as revolutionaries were freed after the war. And by the end of the Civil War, almost as many black soldiers and sailors, about 180,000, fought on the side of the Union as comprised the entire Confederate army of 200,000. Blacks contributed much more to their own liberation during the Civil War than the DC statue of the grateful slave kneeling in front of Lincoln would suggest. And blacks often received their freedom by manumission or the act of being set free by the slaveholder. Sometimes it was for religious reasons, as with some Quakers and Methodists. Some of the enslaved were freed in wills upon the death of the so-called masters. Johns Hopkins' grandfather freed eight of his slaves in Anne Arundel County in 1778. And some were freed when they did extraordinary service to white people, such as saving the life or property of a white person or snitching on another slave. And so many slaves escaped on their own that most newspapers, including the Baltimore Sun, had a stock image to print like the one in the upper left corner representing an ad for a runaway slave. And of course, many came through the Underground Railroad. When the powerful, terrifying winds of the Second Middle Passage swept through the Baltimore region, roughly between the American Revolution and the Civil War, Baltimore's free black community was what was left standing. Baltimore's population in 1860 totaled 212,000 people. And out of that total, 26,000 were free blacks and 2,200 were enslaved. We opened this presentation with a street scene in Baltimore in 1860 that just happened to show some African-American businessmen. This lithograph is another street scene just five years later, showing a group of poor and exhausted freedmen entering the city. These people, recently liberated from slavery by the outcome of the Civil War, had trekked from who knows how far to find a better life in Baltimore. When this group arrived in the city, the Sharp Street Church was already almost 80 years old. Bethel AME was almost 50 years old. And Truman Pratt's Orchard Street Church had already torn down the building that was built by the light of torches and erected its second building just six years earlier. Also, the Reverend Watkins Academy for Negro Youth had until recently for decades been teaching Greek, Latin, Bible study, and the natural sciences to students who were required to write an essay every day. Moreover, Reverend Watkins' niece, Frances Ellen Watkins, had blossomed into a poet who was giving performances even to astonished white people. In 1869, Miss Watkins founded the first woman suffrage movement. And the Bible Institute that was eventually to become Morgan State University was established two years after these freed people came to Baltimore. No doubt these weary travelers in the picture received assistance from some of the more than 30 African-American benevolent societies established to help them find lodging, locate jobs, and meld into the dynamic entity that was Baltimore's free African-American community.
Their hopeful plans, however, were often thwarted by a burgeoning European immigration to Baltimore that started in the 1840s and exploded, pushing many African Americans out of their jobs and homes. This rift is the reason for the black businessmen we mentioned earlier to open the shipbuilding company in 1868. The company could hire some of these displaced workers. And from that time until now, African Americans, no matter how hard they worked or how much they have accomplished, have faced humiliation, segregation, dispossession, and all the many forms of violence associated with white supremacy and institutionalized racism, to which has often been added the blame for the consequences of these. It's a dynamic that hasn't stopped. Our ignorance of this history, for whites and blacks alike, has been part of the racist project of removal. It is a cultural theft that needs as much reparation as economic exploitation. And our often feeble teaching of black history has been widely deficient. We are allow ourselves to remember what for many are regarded as a few special people, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Thurgood Marshall, Martin Luther King, etc., accomplished individuals who are grudgingly recognized as exceptions. They are not. They did not suddenly drop down from the sky or emerge from some subterranean historical basement, nor did they work alone. Each of these leaders were the products of and embedded in a much larger, continuously resilient community of people whose hard work, faith, creativity, and courage in the face of this country's terrorist exploitation is often minimized or ignored as a whole. Letting institutional racism and the myth of white supremacy blind us to the riches of this community and its enormous and often stolen contributions to our whole society is a loss for everyone and diminishes our common humanity. This is a chart which we will visit at the end of this and every subsequent presentation. It vividly illustrates the magnitude of the challenges we face today in unraveling white supremacy and institutional racism. For 86% of the more than 400 years that African Americans have been on these shores, they have had to live with violent, terrorist, legal, and extra-legal oppression in order that wealth could be squeezed from them. In fact, the foundational wealth of the whole U.S. Republic rests mostly on their backs. And all of us are somewhere on this timeline.